This is The Transit of Venus, a short story by Taryn P. Lupo, The Transit of Venus. The woman and the child sat at the laptop and watched a list of names scroll across the screen. The large-bodied African-American woman looked over her shoulder nervously and whispered, Please hurry, sister mother. My co-workers should be back from lunch any minute. The child, her white hair held tightly in a bun, put a finger to her lips. Shh, sister daughter, everything will be fine. The white-haired child surfed the list until a grin rolled over her face. With her tiny finger, she pointed at a name on the computer. I want her. She's the one. Find her and bring her to me, sister daughter. The sounds of weeping echoed around the small bathroom. Nadine sat in the bathroom stall and cried for what had to have been the third time that morning. She looked down on her huge belly and thought, What in the world did I get myself into? Her nose was running, her eyes were puffy, and her dirty face was stained with snot and tears. She steadied herself and tried to speak quietly on her cell phone. My parents told me not to come home. I have no money and Lewis won't return my calls. I can't believe my parents won't even help me. I don't understand it. When Lewis found out I was pregnant, he was excited and said he would help me. I thought he loved me. He was always telling me how special I was and how he chose me. He held out almost all nine months, then just left me, hanging on the street with nothing. Jessica, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I just spent my last ten dollars. Jessica was trying to comfort her friend from the other end of the phone, but Nadine just continued to weep. Really? Are you sure I can't sleep on your couch? Can't you say something to your dad to change his mind? Please, I have nowhere else to go. Nadine paused and listened. Your dad is an asshole. I can't believe he won't let me just crash at your place. Thanks for trying. I, I know it's not your fault. Nadine's phone beeped. Crap. I'm out of minutes on my phone. I got it. Nadine looked at the screen of her cell phone that was beeping and flashing. Zero minutes. With a frustrated grunt, she shoved her now defunct phone into her oversized, grimy backpack and rubbed her large belly. What now? She spoke rhetorically. She pulled at the roll of toilet paper and ripped off a piece to blow her nose. As she spun in the stall to get more paper, her bag fell open and spilled all over the filthy floor. Damn it! She screamed as she tried quickly and awkwardly to stuff her life back into her bag before it was contaminated by piss mud on the public restroom floor. She was saddened to think that her whole life now fit into this bag. As she shoveled her possessions into the ratty backpack, a small, crinkled yellow card caught her eye. She held up the crumpled business card to the dim light and read the words, Thelma Yaten, social worker. She turned over the card. Are you lost, confused, scared, no place to go? There is hope. Find us and never be lost again. Nadine spoke the words aloud as if trying to convince herself to ask for help. Oh, yeah, I forgot that nice lady gave me this. Looking at the address, she thought to herself, This place isn't far from here. It may be my last hope. Nadine finished cleaning up her backpack and blew her nose again. She opened the filthy stall and stared at her disheveled self in the scratched mirror above the filthy sink. She wrestled with some stray hairs, pulled them back into a ponytail, and washed her face. Nadine hardly recognized the girl she saw in the mirror. She was so dirty and swollen from being with child. She wondered how she could be so fat and so hungry at the same time. She sighed and tried to compose herself as she looked at the address on the card one more time. Nadine walked past a sign that read, Welfare and Housing Authority of Savannah, and entered the unimpressive, smelly government building. I always wanted to be a mother, but I never thought I would be seeking help from the government to live and eat. This is not the way I saw my life happening. I'm supposed to be married with a, a house, a husband, and a nursery, a family of my own, picket fences and shit. I am not supposed to be on the street alone with nothing, she thought sadly to herself as tears began welling up and streaming down her face. What am I going to do? she whispered morosely to herself. She barely got into the door before she was ushered into a long line. The queue consisted of a few overweight men and women in wheelchairs, some unkempt elderly, mothers with unruly children, and some young women with babies in strollers. Nadine watched as the mothers completely ignored their loud, bratty children who were destroying the pamphlets on the display. Oh, Lord, she thought to herself, I can't believe this is going to be my life. 
After a long wait, she was directed to sit even longer until the workers returned from lunch. Nadine wanted to take the opportunity to relax, but could not, all thanks to the screaming, unsupervised children that were running amuck. With trepidation and holding on tightly to her possessions for fear they would be stolen, Nadine closed her eyes only to be awakened up by a flying magazine to the face. Two pointing and giggling children ran off, turning their attention to stealing an old man's cane. A large African-American woman opened the door and approached Nadine. "'Hi, I'm Thelma Yaton. You must be Nadine.' Nadine shot up out of the chair as fast as a woman at the end of her third trimester could. Ms. Yaton put a supportive hand on her back. "'Follow me, dear. You don't want to strain your back.' The two tried to make themselves comfortable in a small, cramped office as Nadine told Ms. Yaton the tale of her unwed pregnancy. Both women wept a little and hugged. Ms. Yaton helped calm the young girl, then addressed her situation. "'Unfortunately, getting help takes time, and there is currently a budget freeze. The state won't allow us to help any more women until we get our next round of funding.' Nadine broke down again and yelled at Ms. Yaton, "'What the hell? I thought government was here to help women like me. Now, when I really need a hand, nobody is here for me.' "'I'm sorry, darling. I can't help what the politicians decide. Right now, we can't help you,' Ms. Yaton said to Nadine, knowing full well that what she was saying was not the truth. "'Nothing I can do about it.' "'Sorry,' the woman said as she made a sad face at Nadine and turned her head away. A look of terror fell across Nadine's face. "'What am I going to do now? This card I got from here said if I was lost and scared and found you, I would never be lost again. What now?' Ms. Yaton leaned in and whispered in a secretive manner to the distraught girl, "'Well, I may be able to help you myself. There are a group of ladies I know that help unwed mothers and others in trouble, but they are not affiliated with the state.' They may be able to give you shelter and help you prepare for your new arrival. Do you want me to contact them for you? Nadine's eyes glimmered with desperate hope. Would you do that for me? I would be so grateful. I have nowhere to sleep tonight, and I almost prefer the streets to the homeless shelter. I get harassed a lot by men when I go there. The heavy African-American woman scribbled an address on a piece of paper. I will contact the sisters to set up an interview for you tonight. Be there at 6 p.m., and don't be late. Also, go get your medical records. They will want to know all the details of your pregnancy. Nadine threw her arms around Thelma. Thank you so much for this. I need to go right now if I'm going to get all my records together and make it there by six. I can't thank you enough for getting me an interview. Ms. Yaton made a sign with her index finger and middle finger in the shape of a V and pointed toward the sky. Bless you, child. May the celestial eloquence cheer and inspire you. Nadine was taken aback by the strange saying, but didn't care enough then to ask about it. "'I'll be there at six. she belted out as she rushed out the door. Ms. Yaton grinned widely as she dialed a number into her cell phone. "'I need to talk to Sister Mother Vesper. Tell her it is as the Celestial One foretold it. Tell her I did not have to go find the One. She found me.'" Nadine double-checked the address and surveyed the elaborate structure. The building looked like an old Savannah Greek revival mansion that had been converted into something else entirely. A large domed room was built at the south end of the building. Nadine noticed the structure had what looked like a large, smoked glass skylight running the length of the ceiling from east to west. The whole thing looked architecturally out of place. A large, nude female statue overwhelmed the small courtyard. The figure held a baby in one hand, while the other hand pointed at the sky, her two fingers extended forming a V. Nadine stood outside a decorative wrought-iron gate inscribed with the words, Sisters of the Evening Star. Nadine rang a large bell. Ms. Yaton and a young child came out of the building and let Nadine into the garden and made introductions. Nadine, this is Sister Mother Vesper. The pregnant woman looked over at the young girl. She was very prim and proper for a child, and her attire that evening proved her assumption. She had bright white hair braided into a bun on top of her head, and was dressed in a long black denim dress with black cotton blouse. Her attire reminded Nadine of the old-fashioned prairie garb she saw in old western movies. "'I hope I don't have to wear that outfit. It looks hot and oppressive,' Nadine thought to herself. "'Welcome, my child.' You may call me Sister Mother Vesper. 
Uh, hi. My name is Nadine, she said, and extended her hand to the small, strange girl that had just called her child. Sister Mother Vesper hesitated to touch the dirty girl, but then quickly dismissed the thought and laid her small hand inside Nadine's palm. Nadine was taken aback and felt like she had just grasped an icicle. A creepy feeling swept over her as Sister Mother Vesper's hand felt like that of a corpse, not a child's. The three walked toward the large oak doors and entered together. The house was adorned with elaborate wood molding and high book shelving, plastered crown and cornice reliefs with carved images of naked, fornicating women and men with babies adorned the ceilings. It seemed so out of place with the conservative nature of the women here. The pregnant woman was escorted to a comfortable couch, and they all sat. "'Would you like something to drink?' Sister Mother Vesper offered in a manner more suited to an adult than a child. Oh, some ice-cold sweet tea would be great. I am so hot and I can't stop sweating. Sister Mother Vesper cut her eyes and scolded Nadine. We don't violate our personal temples with drugs. The caffeine in tea is not healthy for you. I will get you some ice water. She waved down a woman in the other room and commanded a drink for the pregnant lady. "'Dear, it is May in Savannah,' the child continued to talk down to her. "'A woman with child like yourself needs to be cautious. "'You mustn't overheat and damage your baby.' "'Nadine found it odd, the manner in which the girl spoke to her. "'I know, you're right, but I haven't had a cool place to hang out during the daytime "'or a safe place to sleep at night. "'I've been sleeping in some public restrooms during the day, "'but eventually they grow wise to me and throw me out.' "'The girl's spindly digits pointed to the files Nadine was carrying.' "'Can I see your records of the pregnancy, dear?' She handed the files over to the little girl called Mother with moderate hesitation as she wondered what a child would want or know of medical records. Sister Mother Vesper methodically dug through the medical records and stopped in her tracks. She quelled her excitement, pointed out something in the file to Sister Daughter Yaton, and then asked Nadine for confirmation. "'Twins? You're having twins?' Well, that's what the doctors tell me, and it sure feels like it. Feels like they're playing soccer with my ovaries, she joked. The sister mother bit her tiny lip and contained her emotions. The records also indicate you'll do the first week of June. Is this correct? That's correct. It's supposed to be right around June 5th, which is just a couple weeks away, said Nadine. Sister mother Vesper promptly excused herself and dragged sister daughter Yaton with her. Enjoy your water and just relax. We'll be back in a few minutes. The two sequestered themselves in a private room. Pull Dr. Esther up on that computer video thing. I want our own tests done on her to make sure this gestation is synchronized with the divine alignment. Sister daughter Yaton and sister mother Vesper fiddled with the laptop until a face appeared on the screen. Vesper informed Dr. Esther of the situation. We found the one, and on further examination we found she is pregnant with twins and... The timing is right. This double birth would be such a blessing for us. I want you to confirm all of this and make sure the babies remain healthy. I impart this most important task on you, Sister Daughter Esther. Dr. Esther accepted the task with enthusiasm. I understand the importance of this and am honored to have you choose me for this task. I will not let you down, Sister Mother. Get her to sign the papers as soon as possible. The three women nodded their heads in agreement, raised their two fingers into the air, and said in unison, May the celestial eloquence cheer and inspire you. Nadine had a very ominous feeling, but she pushed it aside. She didn't care how weird everyone seemed for a minute. All she could think of was not sleeping in the street tonight. Nadine could not remember the last time she got to sleep in a bed or enjoy a long, hot shower. After a long, much-needed night's sleep, she awoke and showered. Upon returning from her bathing, she found all her belongings gone. In place of her old, dingy clothing, she wore into the mansion a black cotton blouse and a long black denim dress that almost covered her toes remained. I guess they took my clothes to be washed, she thought as she buttoned the black shirt. The pregnant girl took a look in the mirror and held her protruding belly. Well, at least my friends won't have to see me in this outfit. I, I would never hear the end of it. She was interrupted while putting her shoes on by a knock on the door. Nadine was surprised to see Sister Mother Vesper standing on the other side. "'Good morning, Sister Daughter. May the celestial eloquence cheer and inspire you this morning. I hope you slept well. I am here to give you a tour of the grounds and show you your chore list,' spoke the strange child woman. 
Oh, I finally slept great. It's amazing how good my back feels when I'm not sleeping on friends' couches and public restrooms. I can't wait for you to show me around, but what, what do you mean chore list? I'm very pregnant. The sister mother rolled her eyes at Nadine. I'm aware you're pregnant, sister daughter, but you still have chores. This is not a hotel stay, my dear. Work makes your soul happy. Before we go out this morning, I need you to sign these papers. Nadine looked at the papers with the super tiny font and asked, What am I signing exactly? The small child looked up at Nadine with puppy dog eyes and stated, They are just your residence papers. All you have to do is initial here and here and here. It's just a formality. Everyone has to sign papers to move in. Nadine knew she had little choice right now, given her circumstance, and without reading, initialed the papers where instructed. Now... "'Follow me, and I will give you a tour of our home,' said Sister Mother Vesper, smiling almost evilly as she took the papers from Nadine's hand. The child moved down the hall, hands folded behind her back, with the nimble grace of a much older woman. The pregnant teen waddled behind her, out the side of the building, into a huge courtyard. Two identical buildings stood at the opposite ends of the large open space. This is our common area. It's mainly used to grow food to feed our brothers and sisters. We try to completely sustain ourselves and even make enough food to sell or trade at market. We eat almost a totally vegetarian diet except the eggs from our chicken coop and the occasional chicken who stops laying. As if on cue, a woman in a large straw hat and black prairie garb walked by with a basket of fresh eggs. A group of men dressed in all-white dress shirts and slacks were busy harvesting heads of broccoli in the massive garden. They all had clean-shaven scalps and faces. I was starting to wonder if there were men here, Nadine giggled. A look of disgust fell over Vesper's face. Yes, we have men, but you will not be talking to any of them, she pointed to the two large structures. They live in the dorm on the east side, and the women live on the west dorm. You will be staying in the main house until your babies arrive, and you don't need to worry about the men. They only mix with the women at supervised events. Vesper then pointed directly at Nadine's baby bump. Besides, I believe you already have enough knowledge of men. Nadine grew defensive, but then realized she did not really have any good defense to that. Instead, the pregnant teen nodded her head awkwardly in agreement. She looked back into the field and thought she recognized one of the men. She was about to ask about him when Sister Mother Vesper spoke and interrupted her thoughts. Now, come with me. We have to hurry if we are going to make our morning meeting. I want to take you to the kitchen. The two ladies rounded the main building and came to a smaller, unattached structure. It had a huge working gas stove with eight eyes, a professional baking oven, and was semi-open to an outside dining area with twenty or so picnic tables. Nadine was confused. Is this your kitchen? Why is it not in the main house? The sister mother grew annoyed. You must have been raised with a silver spoon in your mouth. It's obvious you don't cook or you would know that answer. This is the south and it is summertime. If our kitchen was located in the main house, it would melt us all. Nadine looked confused. Just turn on the air conditioner. We don't have an air conditioner. We just use fans and open our windows. There are far too many mouths to feed to run an air conditioner. It is much healthier to let nature cool us off instead of some man-made machine. Now, we need to hurry before they put out breakfast. The two opened the screen door and were assaulted by a blast of heat. Assemblies of women in black dresses were hurriedly preparing a breakfast of biscuits, eggs, and strawberry jam. Vesper reached over to a bowl of strawberries and bit the ripe tip off of the fruit. "'Sister daughter Nadine, you will help make strawberry jelly the rest of the afternoon. "'We have an abundance of strawberries this year, and we can barely keep up without jelly sales. "'Come here after breakfast, and the sisters will teach you how to make the preserves. "'Now, make yourself useful and carry out that plate of biscuits to the tables outside. "'It's time to eat.' "'Nadine did as she was instructed and waddled out to the group of picnic tables under the enormous live oak tree. "'The other sisters soon joined her, and they set the tables, first for the men's side,' Then for the women and children. She noticed no one spoke unless it was directions or questions about work. One of the women rang a triangle chime, and a group of men wearing all white poured out of the fields. The men came and sat quietly at the tables first, then the women filed in, and sat in their separate area and tended to the children. Nadine estimated a total of about sixty men, women, and children were seated. There were definitely more women and children than men. Sister Mother Vesper took a seat at the head of the women's section and stood up. She pointed to an empty chair at the front of the men's table. 
Once again, our beloved brother, Father Lou, apologizes for not making it to our morning meal. He is still under the weather, so please remember to keep him in your prayers today. Until he returns, the duty of running our commune falls on my shoulders, and I will bless this meal. My fellow brothers and sisters, we thank the Celestial One for maintaining and providing this food to us. The Almighty hath promised us a covenant between light and dark, and that covenant cannot be broken or denied. We cannot break these laws, though they can break us. From the Celestial One's words, we know that the transit of Venus is proof of His greatness and His reward to His faithful followers. Just as He predetermined the holy alignment of our planets, our paths to the Celestial One are also predetermined. We maintain that He is in control of every movement in our lives. May the Celestial Eloquence cheer and inspire you. The Acolytes pointed two fingers in a V formation to the sky and responded in unison. May the Celestial Eloquence cheer and inspire you. The followers sat quietly and began eating. Nadine took a few bites of her jellied biscuit, turned to the woman next to her, and commented, Damn, this is some amazing jam. What's all in here? Vesper snapped at her. Sister daughter Nadine, we don't talk during mealtime. We use this time to reflect and think about how to strengthen our relationship with the Celestial One. Oh, sorry, Vesper. All I was trying to say is that these are some damn good biscuits. The white-haired girl's brow furrowed deeply as she shot a heated glance at the new girl. It is Sister Mother Vespa to you, and we do not use profanity in these holy grounds either. Now, mind your plate and reflect about the Almighty. Nadine waited for the Sister Mother to look away and shot her a mocking look. Well, who is she, anyway? What makes her the mother? She thought to herself, looking at the weird old woman child. Within just ten minutes, breakfast was finished, and the men in white simply got up, leaving the women to take care of all the dishes. Nadine watched the men file back into the fields and once again caught a glimpse of the young man she thought she recognized. She couldn't quite place it. His face was so familiar. Nadine began to walk toward the boy when Sister Mother Vesper shoved a handful of dirty dishes into her arms. Clean up and then help the sisters with making today's jellies. I will see you for our lunchtime meeting, the Sister Mother said coldly and departed into the main house. Nadine found herself clearing the table and washing the dishes with the other women in silence. Every time she went to speak, she was quickly hushed. The kitchen house was crammed tight and every inch was utilized. The cast iron pans and pots were ancient and looked like they had been used for generations. Some utensils appeared to have been handmade out of wood and very worn. Somehow, eight ladies clad in black worked feverishly in the scorching room. One of the sisters blew out all the oil lamps, and it was then that Nadine realized there was no electricity to this outbuilding at all. Even though the windows and doors were open, beads of sweat poured off their faces as the sun rose higher in the sky. Nadine worked up the courage to talk to one of the women cleaning jars when the two of them found themselves alone. I can't believe you guys work in this heat all day long. How do you all not pass out? The younger woman looked over her shoulder nervously and checked out the others working. You get used to it after a few weeks. The worst part is the afternoon. My name is Nadine. I just got here yesterday. Oh, we all know who you are, the young woman said nonchalantly. I have some shorts and a cotton tank top. I could wear them as soon as my laundry returns. The sister continued washing jars and ignored Nadine's statement. Nadine went on. I don't understand why you all wear heavy clothes in the Savannah heat, and why on earth do the ladies wear all black? It's so hot. The sister responded, "'This is the traditional dress of our parish. We wear black to honor Vesper, and the men wear white to honor Lou.' It was then that an elderly woman stepped up and cut her off. "'That's enough talk, you two, and mind what you're doing. We have a great deal of jelly to make today.' Nadine grew annoyed that nobody would talk to her unless it pertained to making strawberry jelly. The heat was exhausting her, and she had to step outside and cool off every few minutes.' During one of her breaks, she noticed an elderly woman sitting with a group of children at the breakfast tables. The boys' and girls' clothes mimicked their parents. The boys wore white dress shirts and pants, and the girls wore black blouses with black floor-length skirts. They were separated from each other, as the adults had been at breakfast. The sister-daughter was reading out of a book and holding up a model of the solar system. Nadine wiped the sweat off of her forehead and thought to herself, "'I wish I could be in that class.' Lunchtime could not come fast enough for Nadine. The babies made her super hungry, and she was looking forward to getting out of the archaic, volcanic kitchen. The exact process that happened at breakfast repeated itself. The triangle was rung, the men showed up, a strange prayer was said, and everyone ate. After the meal, the men in white entered the main house. The women cleaned up and then joined them in the main house. 
Nadine gladly followed without question to escape the heat-drenched little structure. The pregnant young woman followed the herd into a large ballroom that had been converted into a domed sanctuary. The room was very dark except for a pulpit and altar that were illuminated by the clever placement of a large rectangular skylight that ran across the entire domed room. Rows of pews were arranged just so, creating an aisle that ran down the middle of the room, separating the men from the women. The men sat on the east side of the pews, and the women sat on the west side. Above the men on the east side's wall was a picture of a star rising. A mural of the same star setting was over the heads of the women. An impressive large brass model of the solar system sat behind the altar. Nadine was taken aback by the level of complexity and detail etched into the model and tried to figure out how they got something so large into the room. It was as if they had built the room around it. A powerful oil lamp that continually burned illuminated the metal sun. Nadine followed suit and sat with the rest of the ladies, happy to be out of that kitchen's brutal heat. Finally, the children arrived and filed into the back row of pews, boys on the men's side and the girls on the other. Sister Mother Vesper appeared from behind a curtain and approached the pulpit. She was so small she could barely see over the top of it and had to stand on a box. "'Welcome, brothers and sisters, to today's sermon. As you all know, I will be filling in for Brother Father Lou until he is revived. He has conveyed to me his last communication with the Celestial One, and I, in turn, will convey that message to you. Before we share the message, we need to update our holy tracker.' Sister Mother Vesper stepped up to the enormous solar system model and started adjusting it. The large brass arms holding various planets swiveled around the glowing sun. Shadows were thrown around the dark chamber as Sister Mother Vesper arranged the planets and carefully lined them up with the markings on the arms. She consulted a chart and methodically inched the planets into their accurate positions until they matched their alignments in the sky. Vesper pointed at the ceiling with a V motion, and the group followed suit, chanting in unison, May the celestial eloquence cheer and inspire you! As the congregation fell silent, Sister Mother continued, saying, the holy alignment is almost upon us. Soon we will rejoice with the Lord. Your brother, father, the light bringer, has spoken to the celestial one as of last night. The Almighty has reassured him that he will hold strong to our holy covenant and will deliver the resurrection as promised at the transit. Soon the world will know his power and admit their evils. The brothers of the morning star and the sisters of the evening star will lead the lost and free them from their yokes. Society will turn to our ways and those who do not accept the holy truth will be lost forever. Nadine felt uneasy as she peered through the darkness at the rest of the crowd. She watched their eyes glow with fervor with each word that came from the sister mother. "'What have I gotten myself into?' she wondered. The white-haired child addressed Nadine. "'The transit of Venus happens once every other century. Venus passes in front of the sun and eclipses a portion of it. Two eclipses happen over an eight-year cycle, and then the faithful will wait another one hundred and five years for it to happen again. The first transit of Venus of this millennium passed in 2004, the year of my birth on this planet.' The next one happens June 5th, 2012, and will be the most holy in many centuries. The most powerful alignment is almost here. That is why we installed a special skylight so we can look directly at the event without hurting our eyes. Sister Mother Vesper looked to the ceiling. Let us harmonize with the Celestial One and let him fill us with an abundance of energy. The worshippers raised their two fingers into the air and started making circle motions over their heads. One by one, they struck a tone and held the note. The next person would hit a note and harmonize with the last, causing the air to vibrate. Within a minute, the whole room resonated, and the vibrations made Nadine's body tingle inside. Her eardrums started vibrating, and she covered her ears for fear of bursting. Vesper finally crossed her arms, and the followers silenced. Let the Almighty watch over you throughout your day, and may the celestial eloquence cheer and inspire you. The congregation repeated the last phrase in unison. "'You are dismissed,' concluded the sister mother. With that comment, the men in white filed out, and then the women behind them. Nadine waited quietly while the others left the room until she was standing alone in the chapel. She stood there stunned and thought to herself, "'What the hell was that?' As Nadine went to leave the sanctuary, Sister Mother Vesper was waiting for her. "'Come along, Sister Nadine. I have an appointment set up for you.' The two left the compound in an old model van and entered a medical office with a sign that said, Dr. Ruth Esther. 
Vesper and Nadine were promptly escorted past the waiting room process and led directly to a private exam room. A woman dressed in all black and a white doctor's coat immediately came into the room and greeted Vesper with the two-finger salutation. So this is her, sister mother? This is the one you conferenced me about? The child with white hair commanded, I want you to confirm the findings of these doctors. Run all the tests you need to. She handed the OBGYN Nadine's previous records. Dr. Esther walked over to her desk and started examining them. In a mousy voice, Nadine said, Don't I have a say in what tests I want run on me and my babies? Rage flamed in Vesper's eyes, but she spoke quietly. We make sure all the mothers we take in are healthy. Don't worry, I won't let them do anything that will endanger your, uh, children. Now lie down and expose your belly so Dr. Esther can get a better look. Nadine nervously lifted her shirt and prepared for the exam. Nadine finished unloading the last box of jellies and arranged them on the table. Her pregnant, bent spine was aching horribly from carrying boxes and tables. She set up a sign that read, Sisters of the Evening Star Local Organic Jellies. The other sellers at the Forsyth Farmer's Market did not talk to anyone from their booth, but would stare at them curiously. The pregnant woman's belly was near to bursting and kept knocking over jars on the table. The other sisters moved Nadine away from the point of sale and kept her in the back to restock. A familiar voice rang out in a crowd of customers. Nadine, is that you? Nadine recognized her best friend Jessica, ran around the table, and threw her arms around her. Jessica gave Nadine's all-black outfit the once-over and said with a little sarcasm, Holy crap, nice digs! Where the hell have you been? I, I've called your cell phone like a thousand times over the last few weeks. I've been staying with the Sisters of the Evening Star. Um, by the way, is your brother here? I would love to go say hi to him, Nadine said, looking over her shoulder cautiously at the other sister daughters. Her best friend gave her an odd look, then shrugged her shoulders. Uh, yeah, he's over by the fountain. Let's go say hi to him. Nadine grabbed her friend's hand and dragged her through the crowd of disapproving sisters. They made their way down to the fountain, the furthest away from listening ears that they could get. Jessica looked her dead in the eyes. Okay, what the hell is going on? You know I don't have a brother. Oh my god, I think I joined a cult or something. A social worker helped me find shelter, but little did I know she was a member of the Sisters of the Evening Star, too. They took me to a doctor that was in their church, and she gave me this long exam. When they found out I was having twins, they both got very excited. I'm real sorry my dad was such a jerk and I couldn't help you. I feel so bad about it. Have you contacted your parents? Maybe they would help you if they knew what was going on. Nadine cringed. No, they would be no help. I burned that bridge completely when I left home pregnant and with a boy they didn't like. I would have called you and begged you to help me, but these people stole my phone. In fact, they stole all of my belongings the first day, and I haven't seen them since. I was told I, I no longer needed them. Wow, that's kind of nuts, Nadine. But why don't you just leave? Nadine shrugged. Well, they're batshit crazy, but so far harmless. I would leave if I had anywhere at all to go, but nobody wants to take on an unwed mother. I've got nowhere else to go, but let me tell you, it is no free ride. They work my ass off in some nuclear hot kitchen, and they make me go to their weird-ass Venus-worshipping ceremonies all day long. A confused look crept on Nadine's friend's face. Venus-worship? What the hell is that all about? I try to ignore all that craziness, and from what I can tell, they are obsessed with star charts and planetary movements. They think some celestial being on Venus communicates with their leader and tells them what to do. Apparently, the only important thing I can figure out is that this lord, alien, god, thing tells them to make lots of jelly because that's all I do all day. Well, at least you're safe. You look ready to pop. Did you ever locate the father? Nadine shook her head. I gave up searching. You know, I thought he loved me or else I never would have kept the babies. He was way more excited about having twins than I was. No way would I have done this alone. I'm still in shock that he left me sitting in the clinic that day. Her friend smiled. Uh, that sucks. Uh, hey, do you remember... Jessica was cut off as one of the sisters of the Evening Star grabbed Nadine's shoulder from behind. Nadine cringed as she found herself surrounded. Sister Nadine, we need your help back at the booth. Come along now. Nadine tried to hug her friend goodbye, but was pulled away and slowly marched back to the market by the sisters. After a morning of jelly sales, the Order of Sisters rode home quietly in the large van. When they arrived at the compound, Nadine's attention was drawn to a young woman yelling at one of the older sisters. She exited the vehicle so she could hear the disruption better. A young woman in black was verbally attacking an elder sister in front of her class. 
The irate woman yelled, Where is he? I have not seen my son in weeks. Where did you take him? The old teacher responded coldly, You are mistaken, sister. You don't have a son. You helped deliver my baby. You know damn well I have a son. Let me see him. Where is he? The teacher tried to explain to the distraught woman, Did you forget you gave that child to the sisterhood when you signed your papers? You no longer have a baby. That child is ours now. Don't worry, he is safe and healthy. We would never let any harm befall one of our father's children. A group of sisters surrounded the enraged young woman and started to drag her back to the dorm. She struggled and tried to break loose. I want my baby back, you bastards! Give me back my son! She continued screaming as they dragged her back into the building. Nadine watched the scene in disbelief. She rubbed her very swollen belly and looked down. I think I need to get the hell out of here, she thought to herself. Nadine pretended she had not seen the incident and headed off in the opposite direction to do her daily duties. That night, Nadine searched the women's dorm to try to locate the disgruntled woman she had seen earlier in the day. She located her room on the fourth floor and placed her ear against the door. Nadine heard two muffled voices mumbling, Why do you resist our ways so much? Just lay still or the needle will hurt you. The young woman yelped, No, stay away, please, no more drugs. This will help you relax, said the sister daughter. No, the young woman screamed. There, that wasn't so bad. I will be back in ten minutes when you're much more relaxed. Nadine hid in the stairwell and watched until the older sister left. She made a fast move and entered the room. Nadine saw the woman tied to the bed. She was moaning and trying to break her bindings. She saw Nadine and a desperate cry came from her. Help me. Please untie me. Nadine fought conflicted feelings. I, I want to help, but I'm worried I'll piss them off. Just untie me, please. I will tell them I broke out and I won't mention your name, I promise. Nadine gave in and untied her wrists and ankles. What happened to your baby? The panicked woman looked increasingly drowsy and started to slur. Have you not figured it out yet? They take your baby as soon as it's born. It goes to the nursery to be raised by cle collective of el elders. They barely let you see your baby, if, if at all. All the children here think that Vesper and Lou are their parents. Nadine's jaw dropped. That's why they're so interested in my babies. They plan on keeping them as their own? The young woman stood weakly on her feet. Yes, they'll Im immediately se separate you and even move you to another sect to keep you from influ influencing the child. See, they send the young brothers out onto so society to prey on young women who are desperate and in, in need. They're allowed to participate. Parti participate in all the follies and s sins of man. The f purpose is to spread Lou's seed a as per the co covenant with the Celestial One. The boys are encouraged to impregnate as many women as po possible on the outside, then try to persuade them to come here for help. The sisters in the clinic's purpose purposely look for pregnant women who have no outside support. They can bully them into uh, whatever they want. We have to get out of here, slurred the drugged girl. I gotta find my son first. Nadine bargained. Uh, do you have some places for us to go? If you do, I want to come with you. The young woman's eyes glazed over and her speech slowed even more. Yes, you... Must come with me, you don't understand, do you? They are going to do more than just take your babies. They have very s special plans for them. You are carrying Louis's son, the chosen one that is to be. The drugged woman's voice trailed off as she collapsed onto the bed like a sack of flour. Her body grew limp and she stared at the ceiling. Nadine shook her. What do you mean? They have something special planned for us. Tell me. What do you mean, the chosen one? Nadine looked at the flaccid girl and thought, How did she know Louis is the father of my babies? Suddenly the door flew open and a mob of sisters restrained Nadine. Sister Mother Vespers threatened her with a syringe. Careful, I don't want you to have too much medicine and injure your babies. Take her to a room and secure her. 
Sister Nadine must be made to understand we are here to make sure no harm comes to those babies. Nadine's eyes couldn't focus and the room was bright and blurry. She thought she had dreamed it all, but as she came into consciousness, she realized she was completely restrained to the bed. An overwhelming urgency to urinate took over and she yelled, Please, I have to pee! A response of a cold metal bedpan was slid between her legs. She didn't question where it came from and relieved herself. Her eyes focused and she could now recognize Sister Mother Vesper and Dr. Esther standing over her. Vesper spoke in a cold voice. I am very disappointed with you, Sister Nadine. We took you in when nobody else would help you, and this is how you repay us? Shame on you. You will have a chance to repent soon enough. The holy event is almost upon us. Nadine futilely fought her restraints. Why, why are you doing this to me? Are you really trying to take my babies? Take is such a nasty word. We plan on helping them into this world, raising them and blessing them as the holy vessels they are. We can give them so much that you cannot. Screw off, bitch! These are my babies and you're not touching them! Vesper pointed a large needle at her. Just calm down, Sister Nadine. Then again, don't worry. We will make you relax, she said as she inserted the needle into Nadine's hip. The door to the room opened up and an old man in a wheelchair was rolled in. The young man in white pushing the wheelchair greeted Vesper. Your brother Lou is here for his treatment. Thank you. Just leave him here, son. I know you love your father as much as I love my brother. We will do what we can. The event is almost upon us, Vesper said to the young man, giving him a hug. Nadine could barely focus. She was so drugged. She looked over at the boy in the room. It was the boy she'd recognized in the field that day. Is that Louis? My Louis? she thought to herself. He had lost the long, curly locks of hair and beard she had grown to know him with. His face and head were clean-shaven, but even through the drugged haze she could clearly see that it was indeed him. Nadine went to cry out to Louis, but he turned and left before she could make a sound. Sister Mother Vesper leaned in towards the old man and cradled his face in her hands. Dear brother, just hang on one more day. The holy transit is almost upon us. She turned to the doctor. Do whatever you have to, Dr. Esther, to keep Lucifer alive. Nadine freaked out. What, what the hell? Your brother is named after the devil? Vesper rolled her eyes. I am afraid you're not a very bright one, are you? Let me explain it like this. The Celestial One controls the covenant of the universe. The predetermined transit of Venus across the sun is his proof to us that this covenant still exists. The planet Venus is known as the Morning Star, and also the Evening Star. Lucifer, or the Light Bringer, is the name of the Morning Star, and Vesper, or the Light Extinguisher, is the name of the Evening Star. Even though they are the same star, both sexes represent the celestial being as a whole. Somehow, years ago, people started associating the name Lucifer with the devil, but it really has to do with Venus. The men of our sect wear white to honor the light bringer, and the women wear black to honor the light extinguisher. Bestowed are the names of Vesper and Lucifer to those whom have been promised a perpetual covenant with the celestial one. We are the chosen progenitors of our maker with the duty to populate the earth and procure a faithful following for the celestial one. Do you understand now, Sister Nadine? Nadine bucked on the bed. Hell no! And I didn't ask for a history lesson about your whacked-out religion. Just untie me, you bitch! Sister Mother Vesper turned to Dr. Esther. I'm afraid this child is a lost soul. Just keep her medicated until the holy transit of Venus. Dr. Esther did not hesitate and plunged another needle into Nadine's hip. The room was spinning as Nadine tried to open her eyes. It was dark, and Sister Mother Vesper's voice resonated in her ears. She tried to scream, but quickly realized a gag covered her mouth. Nadine bucked and twisted to no avail, and soon realized she was also bound to a hard table. As her eyes focused, she could make out the dark sanctuary filled with the sisters and brothers. 
She stared into the blackness and saw that all the men and women were naked, writhing, and touching each other. Sister Mother Vesper's tiny, booming voice flooded the room. The time is finally here, brothers and sisters. The final transit of Venus has started. Vesper pointed at the large, polarized, smoked-glass skylight that ran east to west along the entire domed ceiling. Only during this short, holy time is a direct conduit from the Celestial One accessible to us. Very soon the transfer of consciousness will be upon us. Let us revel in its majesty. May the Celestial Eloquence cheer and inspire you! The congregation in unison repeated after her, May the Celestial Eloquence cheer and inspire you! Nadine, strapped down on her back to the altar, was too weak to fight. She drifted in and out of consciousness as she alternated between watching Venus transit the face of the sun through the skylight above her head and the congregation indulging in gratuitous sex acts. She could make no sense of any of it. Sister Mother Vesper pointed to the sun as a small black disc entered its corona. All hail Lucifer, the light bringer! The celestial one has proven his covenant to us this day. The conduit is open, and he will bless these new lives into the world. Sister Ruth Esther, bring these new lives into the world. Nadine's head swooned as she saw Dr. Esther lean over her bulging belly with a scalpel. Her mind flashed white hot as the scalpel plunged into her stomach, and she passed out. When Nadine woke again, she focused her open eyes toward the ceiling. The first thing she saw was that the sun had moved all the way across the long window. The black disc had moved to the other side of the sun and was breaking out of the corona. She looked down at her belly that was filleted open, bleeding, and without babies. She tried to cry out, but no sound was made. She heard Vesper speak up over the crying babies. It is time! The Celestial One is ready to transfer Lucifer into the chosen boy child, his heir, the same as I entered my chosen vessel eight years ago. Only once every other century does bringer of light come to walk among us, and that moment is only minutes away. May the Celestial Eloquence cheer and inspire you all! Louis, prepare your father now! Nadine turned her head to see Louis wheel in the nearly lifeless body of his father, Lucifer. The newborn baby boy was placed in Lucifer's limp arms. Vesper unveiled a large ceremonial dagger, almost too big for her tiny hands to hold, and placed it in Lucifer's withered palm. She pointed her two fingers toward the sun and sang a note. One by one the followers then sang out in a harmonized tone. Vesper yelled over the resonance, "'O oh, great and magnificent celestial one, take this soul as tribute and enter this new Lucifer vessel!' Sister Mother Vesper and Louis grabbed the old man's hand, holding the knife, and both of them aided him with the slashing of his own throat. A spray of crimson blood pulsed and showered down, covering the screaming newborn boy as Lucifer went limp in the chair. Nadine tried to scream in terror, but only a muffled whimper came out. She tried to move, but the drugs and bindings held her still, her life slowly draining from her disemboweled body. Vesper picked up the knife off the floor and ordered Louis to place his baby girl placed on the altar where Nadine lay dying. Louis complied and laid the infant girl on Nadine's chest. He stroked Nadine's face, bent down and whispered in her ear, "'You made the best celestial vessel ever. Thank you.' Your sacrifice will never be forgotten. Nadine gazed into Louis's eyes for the last time as her own started to dilate into black orbs. Sister Mother Vesper, holding the ceremonial blade menacingly, climbed on top of the altar and stood straddled over the dying Nadine and her baby. Vesper waved the bloody blade and yelled again over the resonance of the fornicating congregation, May the celestial eloquence cheer and inspire you! The congregation fell into unison, chanting repeatedly, May the celestial eloquence cheer and 